Hi, welcome to Roots to the Bone. And my guest this week is scar trombonist Rick Faulkner, who has played with both the Toasters and is a co-founder of New York Scar Jazz Ensemble, founded in the 90s. Uh, a really interesting mixture of, uh, well, they do what they say on the, on the tin, uh, scar jazz, but also reggae, uh, really taking scar to, to new limits. And um, they, they also backed some uh, foundation artists such as Lord Tanamo, uh, Laura Lakin and Derek Morgan on various tours. So uh, welcome to Roots to the Bone, Rick. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so first of all, uh, I'd love to hear, I asked this of everyone, what your kind of entry point to ska and reggae music was? How did you come to, to be doing what you're doing and fall in oh. love with the sound? Okay, well, it's sort of an interesting journey that I um, actually discovered reggae when I was spent a summer in Germany when I was in high school and um, went there was a, a some kind of garden exposition with a series of outdoor concerts and there was this reggae man that played and I had heard reggae before it hadn't really grabbed me but somehow seeing it live really like really caught me so that when I got back home I started investigating you know listening to Bob Marley and there was a reggae show on the local college station that I listened to religiously every week so from there, um, you know, I, I found, you know, listened to all the normal reggae stuff that was happening in the, you know, 70s, 80s, and so on. And I was aware of the Scatolites and Ska, but where I grew up in Virginia, you really couldn't access any of that kind of music at that time. You know, this is before CDs came along. So um, actually, one of the first shows I went to when I came to New York was the Scatolites. They were doing an outdoor concert um, in uh, at the World Financial Center. I was, I think, I'd have been in New York like maybe a month, and uh, I went down and caught that, and I loved it. Um, but I really got into the scene just sort of backdoor because I was friends with a guy who was summing a lot in the toasters. The the trombone player. Um, Eric Storkman, who preceded me in the band, was sort of phasing himself out to focus on his family. And so other people were subbing in, and a friend of mine recommended me to sub on a tour. And so that was where it started. And whenever I take on a new type of music, I always try to do my homework and make sure I really understand and can do it authentically. So that's when I immersed myself into uh, the two-tone bands like the specials and the beat and and going back really to the jamaican stuff which has always been my favorite of that listening to the scandalites and all that and that's that's how i got into it and then it, that one tour turned into six years mm -hmm. wow so tell me about the toasters um because i think for people they're really well known in the states obviously but uh, outside of the u.s um I don't know how well known they are in the UK, but uh, it'd be interesting just to hear a little a little bit about how the toasters came about. Um, when were they? Well, that's formed? you know certainly before my time. You know the the toasters. They, there's a running joke we used to call, say the toasters were like the menudo of Scott. They, like, we just keep turning people over. Uh, the band version of the band I played with the old, the only constant has been. Uh, Rob Hingley or, or Buck as we call him um, and he founded the group he's a British expat who moved to New York and started the band um, basically with fellow employees at a comic book store he was working at and um, and then it gradually morphed into the first recorded edition of the band in the um, in the maybe the middle 80s I'm guessing and and over time it just it gradually shifted I, I personally feel like our version the band of the mid, early mid 90s was was maybe one of the better lineups that he had um, and he's still going he uh, he tours i think now he just picks up local musicians at wherever he's wherever he's going and that's the toasters for that particular tour or that performance but uh definitely he was coming out of the two-tone vibe with when he was doing the group and it, he was this was really one of the first ska bands to to exist in the states uh him that and bim scala bim and maybe a couple others so they really he was really responsible for i think make creating the ska scene in the in the united states to a large and he founded a label didn't he yeah moon ska uh records which later uh well started out as moon records and then he found out that there was another moon records already it became moon ska and yeah put out a lot of really important 
product. A lot of good, important groups got their start on Moon over the years, and they had a little storefront uh, down in the uh, the East Village in Manhattan, um, and um, which was sort of became a gathering place. When we would go down, that's where we would assemble when we went out on the road. We just everyone would come to the storefront, and you'd hang out, and there'd be fans coming in. It was a really, really nice little scene, and he'd sell. <laughs> It'd sell like vinyls, like all the. He had access to all of the uh, Studio One stuff. He, you know, down. Um, um, uh, there was a, the studio. I'm blanking right now on the name. Um, uh, uh, Cox and Dodd had a store for a out in Brooklyn, and so Buck would go out there and get product from him to sell. So you could like get all these old ska vinyls there and stuff. It was very cool. So was that, was that a ska and reggae? specialist shop or store exactly yeah yeah really okay. ska specialist i mean with reggae kind of coming in as well but yeah uh that was exactly what it was uh selling moon moon records product but also all you know he had all all the studio one stuff the and then also books t-shirts um various other patches patches were big in those days in the ska scene uh, that kind of stuff hmm. it actually it got so successful he had to move to a larger space eventually um wow so I'd really love to hear about the uh, New York Ska Jazz Ensemble uh, because okay. uh, I guess you took the the baton, the, the tradition of the, the Scatellites and ran with it of doing instrumental jazz based Ska. And right. while like, I guess nowadays, you know, virtually every capital city around the world has got some version of a band that emulates the scatellites you know that's mm -hmm. kind of become a thing it's right but back then it was new you know for a lot of ska musicians who'd come out of two-tone type bands ska punk mm -hmm. and then you started hearing these bands that were doing more of a roots vibe a jazz vibe and who'd i guess you'd Coming from New York, you were seeing all these Scatellites gigs. You were party to witness the um, the rebirth of the Scatellites in your hometown. Yeah, that, they were your local that, band. We, yeah, well, not just that. We also, uh, when I was with the Toasters in '93, uh, we spent a month on the road as part of a package tour with them. We had it was a this sort of three generations of ska thing. It was um, the Scatellites. Um, it was the band that they were calling themselves the special beat at that time it was sort of a yeah. mix of former specials and and beat members and then uh the reformed version of the selector was the it was the fourth band and then the toasters mm -hmm. and and we had three tour buses for the four bands we went all all the way out to california and back uh for about about a month and just watching the scatellites perform every night and this is when tommy mccook and roland alfonso were still alive you know it was both they had, lester sterling was on that we were on i was on the same bus i actually was on the bunk above roland alfonso in the uh, in the bus that was my bunk um and uh, lloyd brevet would be back in the back of the bus singing rasta hymns in the uh in the luxury coach thing and but every night the scatellites brought it on and you know they were the, the they wiped the floor with those two-tone bands, I have to say, um, they really brought it every night. These guys, they were in their 60s at that point, mostly, I think. Um, and that, that was a revelation, really, to see them and to get to know them and really hang out. And and so it was on the heels of that that we started having this idea, uh, Fred Ryder and I, about this, because we both came from a jazz background, and um, um, as did Brian Sledge, the trumpet player for the Toaster. And the, the original idea was it was actually just going to be a demo for the Toaster's horn section to be like as a horn section for hire. But I don't, we'd also had this idea, well, you know, Latin jazz is big right now. Hip hop jazz hybrid was happening at that point. So it's like, why can't we do the same thing with ska and reggae? And that's that's kind of where it started. Um, Sledge didn't wind up sticking with the project. Uh, so it wound up being me and Fred running it. And we just made a dream list of who would we like to have in our band and every one of them said yes and that was the great part of it you know that we had uh devon james who was the, the scatellites guitarist uh carrie brown had been keys for the scatellites for a while and then played we played with him in some other settings um we brought the toasters drummer john mccain on board and then uh, victor rice from the scofflaws was our bassist and that was the original lineup that lasted for i don't know four or five years uh, with a few sub substitutions. And the idea was to keep the roots of the ska and reggae rhythms and do what the Scatellites did, but maybe expand the jazz palette a little bit in getting mm -hmm. into some um, slightly more advanced harmonies that they probably wouldn't have done 
back in the 60s, um, drawing on things like John Cole, what Don Coltrane did, and maybe even some some of the fusion jazz of the 70s, but trying to stay t- true to the roots at the same time. And that's, that's mm-hmm. and it just, it just sort of happened. We made the recording, it was supposed to be a one-off project, and then we got asked to participate in a show at Manhattan Center in uh, in New York um, on a bill with the Toasters and a few other bands, and the reaction, the response was really good. And then the guy who booked the Toasters tours in Europe was interested in bringing us over there, and we found we had a pretty good audience in Europe, we were able to tour like once a year over there for several years. And I, I think Fred's still going over there at least once or twice a year that we've, the band really had a good, developed a good following. And, uh, for instrumental, mostly instrumental music, I think that was a pretty amazing thing. So did you have a vocalist at all? We did, um, on the recordings, we would often bring in guest vocalists. Like our first album, the one vocal track we had was, uh, we had the guys from Hepcat, uh, who was always one of my favorite, more traditional ska bands from that time, from California. They did a Toots and the Maytals cover, but our drummer, Jonathan McCain, also was a very good singer. So gradually we started incorporating more vocal numbers and using him as a, uh, to help uh, add a little bit more interest for people who would, would might be turned off by a full instrumental program, and mm-hmm. and that was basically how we did it. And then the rest of us would contribute harmony and backing vocals uh, if needed. But uh, John John was a great singer, so it was really good to work with him. And having the lead vocalist behind the drum set was kind of a unique look too. Yeah, it's always cool to see a drummer singing. Mm-hmm. There's always a sense of like, how do they do that? <laughs> multitasking yeah, so here's a question did the scatolites any members original members of the scatolites did tommy and roland or either of the two lloyds ever see the new york scar jazz ensemble play that is a good question and i can't swear to it one way that although tommy we brought tommy in for two tracks on our first album um, mm-hmm. Um, we tried to get Roland and one way and another, it never worked out, but Tommy came in and did two tracks and he definitely seemed to be enjoying what we were doing. He was also nice enough to correct. Uh, we had, we were covering this old, um, big band era tune called Harlem Nocturne. And he listened to our, our rough take of, he said, you know, that melody, you got the melody wrong there. And he, he, he fixed it. So <laughs> that was kind of cool to have, uh, yeah. have his input, but no, he, 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 he liked it. And, um, I, I can't swear whether we ever did a, a bill with the Scatolites or not. You know, it's you know twenty plus years ago now, and a lot of that's a lot of gigs under the under the bridge. But uh, but Tommy certainly liked us. I, I, that's that much I can say. Mm. One thing I've often heard people say who were around the ska scene uh, in New York or on the West Coast around that time was how accessible members of the Scatolites were, you know, they weren't like really aloof or, you know, they, they basically loved the fact that everyone loved them mm-hmm. <laughs> and that yeah, they, no, definitely. you know, if you wanted to talk about um, saxophone reads to Tommy McCook, he, you could sit and talk to him, you know, and he would share whatever he knew with you because he, he's, he wasn't, they weren't kind of protective about themselves in that way and they were very generous yeah I, I absolutely agree with that they were they you know then that going back to that package tour that i was talking about certainly you know there was no rock star vibe coming off of them unlike uh some other people who i won't name <laughs> yeah um and, you know they were you know very very down to earth i think that they didn't take it for granted you know given that they there'd been like a period of, I think some of them had kind of slipped into semi-obscurity for a while. And so the, to have this second chance to be out there and have these huge crowds loving what they're doing and, and knowing what they did, maybe in some cases were better than they remember it themselves. I think that was a, a major, a major uh, thing for them. And so, but they were all really down to earth. Um, last time I saw Roland Alfonso, the one thing, uh, the last time I saw him, I don't remember what the occasion was, but it was some show we were both on and he saw me walk in and he said, hey, draw me, you got any wine? That was, <laughs> yeah. Did you? <laughs> uh, no, unfortunately, I, I wish I had. I wish I had. Um, 
it was a very funny Lester Sterling. We 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 took Lester out on the road with the Toasters as a special guest artist a couple times for tours, and uh, he'd sit and talk. We'd talk music theory sometimes, sort of out of the blue. He'd shout out from the back, "How you spell, you know, C seven minor flat five and <laughs> and then, and he'd, he'd quiz us to make sure we knew. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, those those alpha trained musicians, musicians who went to alpha boys school. Um, Kingston's, uh, you know, the boarding school, I'm not explaining this for you, but for anyone who doesn't know. Um, of course, yeah. Um, the Alpha Boys School, which was run by nuns, and uh, four members of the Scatolites went there, and many other uh, Jamaican horn players uh, and other musicians came out of Alpha Boys School. Uh, they were so drilled in music, you know, music theory from a really young age, you know, you know nine or ten. Uh, they they were able to write, you know, compose music, arrange music, play really tightly and improvise, and they had swing, you know, they could really swing, those guys. And, you know, it's, it's just amazing that, uh, you know, that they brought that into the music and kind of transformed, or they, ele I think they elevated, they lifted the bar for, um, I mean, maybe no one really knows whether, whether it would have happened anyway without them, but the alpha trained musicians, you know, my feeling is that they, that they just brought something of, you know, they elevated it with, with their yeah, training there's, and discipline. It's a really interesting, it's sort of a combination of the street level energy with that actual training and, and that, that's something that, say, you know, like Byron Lee's band didn't necessarily have. They had the training and the polish, but not, you know, there's when you listen to them playing Scott, there's always something that just doesn't seem like it's quite there, you know, something the rhythm rhythm isn't there. But but that, yeah, that to have have both the highbrow and, and street level stuff coexisting, I think that really did raise the bar a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I just w would like to ask you. Uh, a question or two about Don Drummond because um, you know I'm I'm creating this comic book series, Trombone Man, Scars Fallen Genius about Don Drummond, and uh, I guess you know I'd like to ask you what made him a genius in your eyes? What was so great mm. about Don Drummond? That's a you know I've been thinking about that, and that's you know it, it's a combination of, of a couple different things that he had a technical skill and polish that that was definitely you know high of maybe one of the greatest trombone players in jamaica in that regard i think um and that he was able to play fluidly and and could execute very rapid runs but the thing for me with with him is just that there's there's a depth whenever he plays there's this something something deep and maybe it has to do with the the you know the tragedy that eventually would engulf him i don't know but you know you listen to some of those those songs and it's it's just really it's soulful it's deep especially some of those minor key ones like confucius that's just i don't know it, they're, they're, it's it's almost indescribable and i i um but at the same time he also would write these these melodies that are very evocative and he was able to you know i was listening today just to some the way he would harmonize the horns was definitely much more advanced than than the average you know um pickup um recording session might have done at the time and more advanced than maybe even like a, a trained arranger of the 50s and 60s would have done and and that that i guess that's where the genius lies um just it's it's almost that that's that quality that you can't really pin down mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if there was one producer from Jamaica, if you could rewind time and go back to the golden era of Scar, who would you like to have worked with? Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, certainly Cox and Dodd produced a lot of great stuff. Um, the um, I'm not sure I could pick a single one. I, I'm very fond of the the tracks that that Don and others did for Top Deck, the with uh, just Justin Yap, right? Yeah. That's his his label. Those those really 
there's a certain additional polish there from what I understand that mm. Yap was a little more, took a little more care and like wasn't just cranking things out as fast as possible. And so you can hear a little more thought went into those recordings. Um, yeah. I would have loved to work with Scratch Perry, even though he was nutballs. <laughs> and um, also sort of my fun, another favorite of mine, just because of the Toasters connection, Jack Ruby. Um, wow, was, yeah. you know, yeah. Because his son was a vocalist with us for, for, for the, about the second half of my time with the band. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I love the way like the, uh, the Marcus Garvey album with Burning Spear and some of those other things that he, he did. Um, so any of those I would love to work with. And, yeah, um, the, 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 the Yap recordings of the Scatolites are among my favorites that they did. And uh, those tapes languished in a fridge, didn't they, for years. Um, I didn't know driving. that, but I'm not surprised. Yeah, he, um, I think it was just Justin Yap. It was two brothers, wasn't it? Um, and yeah, he went and he was driving cabs in New York City and the whole for years. Um, and they were just in the back of his fridge at the right temperature. And at some point, um, late 90s, he, you know, he got them all polished up and digitized and they were released on CD finally. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're great. I you know I really rate all that stuff. And uh, apparently their mother ran a, a restaurant with an ice cream parlor in it. And yeah. so they used, they used to when they were kind of when the, the brothers were coaxing the, cath the scatolites to re to record for them they, they got them down to the, the mother's restaurant and gave them all loads of ice cream and pretty plied them with food and i think they thought great you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> I I mean, sold them the ice cream you, sold you it. can't underestimate how that, that a little bit of of things like that will help uh, create good feelings in a musician yeah, yeah. And, you know, to think that they were spending a lot of their time chasing down payments for mm -hmm. sessions that they did. And right. then these two brothers came along, plied them with ice cream, paid them up front, gave them plenty of weed and let them play all night and do what they want. And I think that's what created such fantastic vibes on, on those yeah. particular recordings. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, finally, Rick, I just want to uh, ask you, if you can add a couple of trombone led tunes to our growing Spotify playlist, what do you have sure. for us? Sure, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if one or more of these has already been named, but I will say for, for Don Drummond, I love Reburial. That's, that's I think, one of my favorite solos of his. That was mentioned, I believe. Yeah. And the Reburial of Marcus Garvey was, um, you know, it's, it's full title, isn't it? Mm -hmm, right. Yeah, well, that's yeah, a great yeah. tune. Yeah. Well, that's we can have that. From, that is definitely because for him, for me, that's one of the cases where I think his sound got captured the best in the studio. Trom I find that trombone sound is notoriously hard to record, and I always wish I could have heard Don Drummond live or recorded in a state of the art studio of the time, like you know the Rudy Van Gelder studio here in New Jersey that all the Blue Note records recorded at, and hear what he really sounded like. Because I don't think that those those uh, recordings from the 60s completely do his tone justice. But I think there it's it's one of the better ones. And just the fluidity and the soulfulness of how he plays, that's why I love that one. Uh, the other ones I, that came to mind are um, for Rico. I mean, of course, all of the whole man from Warica and all that. But I less less commonly thought of that I love is uh, the Prince Buster uh, Barrister Pardon. Um, <laughs> where it's just like basically halfway through the track, he just turns Rico loose and, and just lets him blow and uh, over the, uh, over the judge dread rhythm. And uh, yeah. that, that's, a, that, that's one of my favorite Rico solos. Um, and I would say Vin Gordon's playing on, um, on warrior charge by Oswald. That would be my favorite uh, one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I have that on a 12 inch with the B side on the 12 inch is dub charge. Do you know dub charge? I haven't heard dub charge yet. I got oh. I, I, uh, I need to go check that out. Um, yeah, I think you'll find it on YouTube, no doubt. But yeah, in yeah. fact, I saw it this morning. <laughs> when I was looking. Yeah. yeah, I think that's one of the, yeah. um, the oldest records I have. I think um, you know, uh, early, earliest records, uh, reggae records I bought was Warrior Charge, sometime in the early nineteen eighties. Yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, I've I've actually chatted to Vin about the circumstances around 
um, Moria charge. I think there's two trombone solos on there, isn't there? There are. Yeah, yeah, he comes yeah. in and out twice. Like you know, it's one of these things where they stretch the track and so they they shuffle. I think they shuffle the solos. There's an uh, alto sax. Is uh, I'm forgetting who the alto sax player is that mm. is mm. interspersed with him. But what struck me listening to that is how much I hadn't listened to it in a while. How much what he's playing is similar to a lot of the stuff I was doing on reggae when I was playing with New York Scott Jazz Ensemble. It's like, yeah. it's, I guess both absorbed what Don Drummond did and, and our own jazz influences and it came out kind of sounding somewhat similar. So mm-hmm. I'll take that as a, as, a <laughs> as, as a win. Okay, Rick, well, thank you so much for talking to us. And can you just uh, let folks know where they can check out your music? Do you have a home, a hub? Your sound. I, well, I don't have a, a, a page at the moment. There's, um, I have um, the on Facebook. You can look me up there, and I, I have a page there for my music publishing, which is a whole different side of my persona. Um, but um, otherwise, yeah, the, I if I, you can track me down through Facebook, and um, I can that's will lead you to whatever other stuff is out there. But I don't at the moment. I don't have a website. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming on. And uh, please, uh, if you're enjoying these interviews, don't forget to uh, hit subscribe down below and give us a like. Uh, Appreciate your support and uh, look out for the next one. Thanks for coming to. Thank you, Rick. Much appreciated.